Hello everyone, you are listening to the Eiffel Tower podcast. My name is Oliver G. This is a show about Paris and France and everything that comes with it. And one of the big parts of that is wine, and I'm sure you all knew that. That's probably why you clicked on the episode. Today's guest is a sommelier. Do you hear how I pronounced it differently from sommelier? That's because uh, that's how you say it when it's a woman, which is a topic that we talk a little bit about. I didn't even know, I didn't even think that there was a difference uh, in the word, and you'll hear me learn that a little bit into the conversation. But the guest today is Atelia, Atelia Hananova, and she is a Canadian sommelier, as I said, in Paris. She works at the restaurant Comis, which is 31 Rue de Versailles in the 16th arrondissement. Uh, she runs it with her husband, Noam, and at that restaurant is where we recorded the interview and where we talked about uh, everything from uh, how she got into the industry, uh, sort of a few tips for if you're ordering wine in a restaurant, uh, a good story too about how the restaurant got its Michelin star, and as always, plenty more than that. I'll be back at the end to uh, repeat the name of the restaurant and uh, to tell you how to find it and a little more from uh, the world of Earful Tower. But here we are. Imagine you're in the 16th hour this morning with me in the restaurant. It wasn't open to the public at the time, so uh, you might be able to hear in the background the last of the marathon runners uh, running right past the front door. But here we go. A chat with Atelier Hananova. I hope you guys enjoy it. Atelia, how are you? I'm very well. You have. You must be honest. How is my pronunciation of your name? Correct. Correct. Atelia. 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 Okay. Yep. It is a lovely name, and we talked about it before. It's a bit. Uh, this Russian. It's like a derivative of my grandmother's name in Russian. Right. And the restaurant Comis. Yes. Where did that come from? Uh, it comes from the Comis Agricole. So it's gatherings of farmers that started in the 1800s in the Loire Valley, and they would get together to talk about how to improve their trade or how to um, improve techniques and sort of, you know, chat about how things are going in the in the region and, right. and they still exist today. Right. And uh, we work with um, we work with a lot of small farmers and we try to um, focus on sourcing products carefully so it's a bit of an homage to their work. Do you find like uh, you talk a lot about etymology, restaurant name, your name, that kind of um, stuff? Um or is it just when I'm here? Less today, at yeah. the beginning a lot. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Because you guys are established now. Uh, it's been four years, just over four years. I was looking now. through uh, yeah. some Instagram, like your Instagram account, their Insta- you know, your uh, restaurant's Our. Instagram account, yeah. and I was uh, seeing some of the clips of the newspapers and stuff that have... Uh, you guys yeah. are a big deal. Um, I guess, yeah. Yeah. I but guess. Can we talk about the Michelin star as well? Yeah, sure. Can we talk about it from an idiot's perspective first? Sure. Like... I had a friend that visited Paris recently and he said he was going to a Michelin star restaurant and I was like there's no way that's a Michelin star restaurant that he went to and I think it was like recommended by Michelin or something like that. Okay. What well, do you know what what I mean, of course you know but what's the difference between Well, Michelin has the Michelin guide has a few different sort of veins of recommendations and it's sort of based on different categories but they have the Bib Gourmand, they have the Assiette, they have the Stars. So, um, the Michelin guide kind of touches a very wide range of different kinds of restaurants and they make recommendations based on restaurants within their category more or less so okay. it's not just stars but getting a star is like essentially the biggest deal you can have besides getting two stars it's a very it's a very um profound recognition of the work that's done in the cuisine of a restaurant especially in paris especially in france because it's sort of one of the most uh, established and uh, long-standing guides that is respected and revered by a very wide range of mm, people, mm. and um, and so it's really a recognition that matters in in France. I mean, all over the world, but uh, this is sort of the hallowed country of yeah. gastronomy yeah. And historically. And and as foreigners living in France and practicing the art of French cuisine and in a fine dining manner, it's sort of a big deal, yeah. It's absolutely. wild. What did you yeah. and your husband, it's Noam, right? Noam, yeah. Noam, uh, yeah. what did you guys do when you, wh- okay, wh- when you, what happened? well, when you find <laughs> out, were you already, you, you didn't know at all, right? No. So we opened in September of 2017 and the Michelin inspectors visited us just a few weeks after we opened. Goodness me. Um, because you just opened or? I have no, we don't, you don't know. You did don't you, know why somebody knows you're there. Really? Or why did you know that they were coming in even? No, no. Oh, wow. uh, a gentleman reserved totally normally yeah. um, 
came at lunch. We used to do lunch. We don't do lunch anymore. And um, he sat down and he said, I'm waiting for a friend. And we just served him normally. And my husband was kind of like, mm, I have a funny feeling really? about that guy. He had a little bit of a, a sense that maybe it could have been a Michelin inspector. Really? But we were like in the throes of opening and totally... Um, you know, underwater <laughs> with all kinds of stuff. And his friends joined him and they spent the afternoon, you know, discussing or whatever. They did talk a lot about restaurants and shit. And then they talked with your husband about it? Or? No, no, they were talking to each other. And uh -huh. I kind of overheard that they were talking a lot about restaurants. But again, uh, we were sort of like kind of fuzzy with yeah. opening craziness. And at the end of the meal, the, the second gentleman who had had lunch got up and said, I have to run, but thank you so much. It was a great experience and see you again. And he took off. And then the first gentleman said, I, you know, I would like to introduce myself. I'm, I'm a Michelin inspector. After and I he'd wanted, eaten. After yeah, he oh, after wow. he'd, And so we were like, oh, okay. And so my husband sat and spoke to him and explained, you know, his ethos of the cuisine and all that stuff. And, and that was it. So, you know, at that point, we had only been open for a few weeks and we had absolutely no idea, yeah. um, you know, what would come of it. But come, you know, February, so just four months later, we, we actually did get a call from the president of Michelin at the time um, who said, um, you know, congratulations, you've been awarded a Michelin star. And that was, you know, a really big deal. Okay, let's, let's, I want to be <laughs> in the apartment or wherever you are. What happened that well, moment? We were, was so, it Noam that got the call? No. Uh, no. So we were, it was Friday night and we were at work and it was like 7 p.m. So it was just before we were opening and actually we were kind of having a bad day. Like we were really stressed out. Things right. were just like kind of hairy that day. Yeah. And so we were kind of in not the greatest mood. And, um, and I was answering the phone because people were calling to reserve and I'm like, commis bonsoir, commis yeah. bonsoir. And I answered the phone, commis bonsoir. And, um, imagine if you were like, uh, Mr. Michelin, okay, table for two, I'm going to go <laughs> hang out. <laughs> It wasn't like well, that. Well, <laughs> no. Um, he, so the gentleman on the other end of the phone said, Hi, um, I'm calling from the Michelin guy. Can I speak to the chef, please? And I kind of like almost threw my phone into the kitchen. I was like, no, I'm going to answer the phone. It was the Michelin guy. And uh, Noam grabbed the phone and went into the front of the restaurant in front of the column. And he was just like nodding. And I was like staring at him, kind of trying to figure out what, you know, what's going on. And he was just nodding, nodding and saying, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then he smiled and he was like, thank you thank you very much and I was like thumbs up thumbs yeah. down yeah. thumbs up and he was like yeah thumbs up <laughs> so it was pretty exciting but on the phone it was so it was the president at the time Michael Ellis and he was like oh and and by the way um I've been to your restaurant it's fabulous congratulations we we're like uh what sorry like, the president of Michelin has been to our That's restaurant cool. and then we realized he was the second gentleman that uh -huh. was having lunch with the Michelin inspector and we didn't realize it at the time I wonder what because uh, you said that you and or your husband had a sense that they were like was it like a like a hat that they were wearing or no, no, a no, way no. that they ordered or it something? was just actually it was that he was uh, quite serious looking and right. bit discreet yeah. and kind of looking around a lot and sort of taking in the room in yep. a way that was kind of analytical I think that was yeah. so, but you know so many people do that for so many different reasons so I think my my husband was just concerned yeah. <laughs> and acutely aware of the possibility that they yeah, might yeah. come and so he kind of was like checking out every guest because there weren't so many people coming in at the beginning it was still early on sure, so yeah well they must have been tipped off from someone right I have no idea. Yeah. Honestly. What a cool story. I love yeah. it. And then what happened? Did, did, did you guys announce it to the diners? Or uh, we, we weren't allowed to say anything for the whole weekend. Oh, because... man. I would have wanted to just <laughs> ring a bell and tell so everybody. So the launch was uh, of the guide of that year was on the following Monday. So we had to wait all weekend. And I didn't tell anybody at all, except we did tell our team, obviously, and everybody was mm -hmm. very excited mm -hmm. about it. And I just had one friend visiting from Montreal who happened to be coming in for dinner that night and he didn't know anybody and like wouldn't tell anybody. I was like, I just have to tell one person. So I told him and he was like, oh my God. Wow. I was like, I know. Well, congratulations. And what a lovely story. And thanks, thanks. for sharing it. Pleasure. Uh, but I also really want to dive into a lot of other topics. Okay. Mainly wine. Okay. Because that is your métier. That, that is, is my métier. Uh, expertise. You're a sommelier. I am a sommelier. And... Uh, as I understand, there are probably, I don't know the percentage, but there's not as many, definitely not as many women doing this job as men in Paris. No. Uh, do you know like what kind of percent we're talking here? No idea. Even vaguely, even roughly? I'm going to take a stab in the dark and guess that women represent maybe 10 to 15% okay, of, the, wow, okay. of the French uh, workforce in some of So how, do, how does it feel to be uh, so totally under-represented, uh, re but... Um, pretty classic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of 
very many metiers in which women are properly <laughs> represented, period. No, so. right. And, but do you feel that it, uh, like, people treat you differently based on it? Does it happen, uh, like, customers? It's almost never now. Right. Almost never. It's, uh, I've been working in restaurants since I was 15 years old, and my parents used to own restaurants, so I've, like, grown up in this uh, business all my life. Um, I started working in wine in 2008, so I've been working in wine for almost 15 years now. Wow. And um, in the beginning, I got more comments. And I kind of... I, so I lived in Montreal and worked in Montreal for many years. And in Montreal, there's a much better balance, I find, of sommelier versus sommelier. Right. Um, Hang on, I said sommelier, didn't I? That was yeah, wrong. I should have said sommelier, sommelier. But that's more about my French than my... I think in, I think in English, uh, people don't usually say sommelier because... No. Because that's French, no. you know, no. and uh, people. Don't it's like have it's like a lot of people when they're writing in English don't realize that there's a different way to spell fiance. Exactly. A lot of people or blonde. Yeah. yeah. You know, like yeah. guys, they're add an e yeah. if you're talking about yeah. a, a woman, yeah. right? But it's just it's a language thing. Yeah, so, sure. Um, in Quebec, there was a better representation of women. I found in the uh, sommelier field, uh, and when I came to Paris in 2014, it kind of I felt like. I took a step back again because there were less women and I did feel that there was a bit of a like a suspicious nature to some of our guests in the restaurant that we were working yeah. at where they'd be like you're a foreigner and you're a woman how could you possibly be That's the person double, double minority. who's going to like recommend wine to us and a few weeks ago it still happened where there were guests really nice people from the United States who came and and they were a little bit um knowledgeable about wine and my waiter who works at the restaurant was serving them and talking to them and they wanted to order wine from him and he doesn't know anything about wine or yeah. very little yeah. so he went to defer to me and I came over and I was like what you know have you got any questions and they were like no no no, it's okay we, we got this like and they went to turn back to him really? because he was you know wearing a suit and a tie and he was a gentleman and he was helping them with the with the food menu and I think they just couldn't Wow. Wrap their heads around the idea that I was going to be the one who took that over. Do and then and then they came around and realized that I had written the wine list and I was the person yeah. to talk to. But it was kind of surprising. It had been a while since that had happened. That is weird. And it's weirder still that it was Americans that did it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it but was, do you feel funny. like uh, maybe the question's more about being a foreigner than, than being a woman? Is it that, could be. Uh, it could be. Is that like your peers in other restaurants? And do, I mean, I, I can only assume that you, you go to... Uh, what do you call them, events, not events, but, you know, where everyone gets together. Yeah, uh, to less less now today yeah. than, than I used to, um, because in all honesty, when I was a sommelier, sommelier employee, I used to have time to do that, but as right. a restaurateur, I don't have time to do not that to as much. Not to mention everything else you got going on in your, in There's your, a lot happening. In your private life, yeah. including dogs that yeah. eat, eat shoes and so on. There's a lot of care <laughs> involved in my life. Not to mention a marathon going on outside the window. There's, that can't make life yeah, easy. Yeah, just watching it is tiring. Uh, don't you think? I was, yeah. So when I walked, so everyone, uh, we're recording this at the day of the Paris Marathon 2021, uh, which is, because uh, this episode's coming out tomorrow, so okay. yesterday, everybody. Um, and I was telling you as I walked in, I walked along these people like shoulder to shoulder and I've never been so close to so much emotion. Like people who were like injured, giving up, yeah. uh, really like older people who yeah. were struggling. I was like, wow, this is like a, this is like a, this is it's a very intense. dramatic thing. Yeah. Yeah, My husband was looking out the window earlier at the runners and he was like, oh God, I've never seen so many people looking cramped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was yeah. like, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of highs and lows in this process. Yeah, wow. I can recommend to everybody if you if you're not a marathon runner to walk uh, in the opposite direction up close because it is it's it's like a yeah. movie. But that's not what we're here to talk about. I want to talk about uh, in in terms of uh, wine. I'm really interested because I know I was reading a little bit about you. I know that you started as a, a server or a, wait, a yep. waitress, um, but I guess at some point in your life you realized you were really good at tasting and smelling wine. No, not at all. Actually, yeah. I pursued um a career as an opera singer for 10 years really? and i used to work in restaurants as a way to fund my studies uh -huh. and i worked in very fine establishments that had good wine lists but i wasn't in any way particularly interested in pursuing it as a career and then i moved to new york and i tried to take singing to the next level and failed <laughs> i was very good but there were 
thousands of people better than me. I feel and like that, that must was, be one of those jobs where you have to it's be like top. It's like the NBA. Like, like the NBA. Not everybody You're talking my language here. Yeah, yeah. you got to be yeah. top point, point one yeah. or less. And like, you're not going to make any money playing like regional basketball. Right. Well, or you're not being gonna, a regional opera yeah, singer, right? Not a lot. Oh, wow. So What language did you sing in? Mostly Italian. Oh, wow. So I kind of thought to myself, either I'm going to take it to the top level or I'm just going to do something else. And I didn't manage to take it to the top level. So I said, I'm going to do something else. And within a weekend, I decided that wine was going to be the thing because I wanted with singing to do something that was a perpetual learning experience that was uh, involved languages, that involved travel, that involved meeting people, that involved um, constantly uh, opening my eyes to new things. And I figured wine would probably be the most logical Wow. thing within my realm yeah. you know, I wasn't going to switch careers into something that was completely sure because it was in your realm because of your yeah. family and restaurants it was were... something that I, I was familiar with that I was interested in but not you know particularly involved in until then and then and then I just had this opportunity I was living in New York and I started going to wine tastings okay. there right and I got really interested in artisan winemakers and small farmer winemakers who uh, sort of make small production um, wine, are really conscientious in the vineyards. Um, you but know, this is a bit just, to, just to, to understand, at this point you're thinking you want to make a career of this. Yeah. Uh, so you must have already known that you you must have already had a deep interest in it beyond the average I was joke. interested. Yeah, okay. I was interested. Yeah. It was something that I had always wanted to you know make an effort okay for you know because at the time it was my side gig but i wanted to do my side gig well sure. and uh and then when it became my main gig i wanted to do it really well right and um so i went back to montreal and i studied sommelier i went to school for a year a very intensive course and then i worked in some very good restaurants in montreal with excellent wine lists wow and what do they, what do they with, teach you at the Somalia school? How do um, they do it? They give you, they give you like you know, there's geography, there's terminology, vocabulary, um, the process of wine making, how wine is made, uh, you know, all kinds of different stuff. How to taste, yeah. and and so going back to what you were saying, you must have realized you were really good at tasting right. and smelling. Not at all. I actually realized that I had no bearings whatsoever really? for the process, and and I remember very distinctly being in school, and our teacher was like. Um, you know, so we're going to do a tasting lesson today. What do you smell and what do you taste? And I was like, uh, red wine. Yeah. <laughs> like, I have no idea yeah. how to quantify or qualify anything that I'm perceiving. Yeah. And what really struck me within that year was how much wine is a learning process and it's an empirical process. And yes, there are people with innate talent who just have a high sensitivity mm. to aromas and flavors mm. but i'm not one of them wow. it wasn't a natural process i had to learn it and it was by tasting and smelling and tasting and smelling and especially doing that with people who were more experienced than yeah. i was to give me the bearings that i needed to be able to develop those so you put skills. in you put in the hours basically yeah yeah it's yeah. interesting because you uh so you were kind of near the top of opera as in, like you were, you were aiming for the top yeah, anyway, and aiming. you were at the bottom of wine, but you made yeah. that leap. Yeah. Uh, that's very brave. I actually accomplished what I wanted to accomplish with singing much more in what I do now, Yeah, uh, funnily enough. You so. accomplished more in singing? What do you mean? No, I accomplished more in wine okay. than in singing yeah. uh, of all the, you know, all the things that I just said, yeah. um, you know, traveling, meeting yeah, yeah, people, yeah. feeling like I'm constantly learning about something, uh, you know, all of the things that sort of appealed to me about uh, a potential career in opera, I actually managed to realize those wishes within my That's wine wonderful. Work. Yeah. Um, so. I feel like um, it's really encouraging to hear that you can learn tasting and smelling yeah. uh, for things like wine. Because I per personally, I think I've said this on the show before, I remember I went to a wine tasting sort of, a, you know, like very, very, it wasn't a course or anything, it was at a vineyard somewhere in Australia. And they said, let's start easy. What can you smell there? And everyone yeah. smelled something. Go lemon, and I and I couldn't even smell it. Yeah, I couldn't even smell the lemon. Yeah. I felt there's something weird because I know, like, if you can't see very well, you yeah. go to the doctor. They give you glasses. Yeah. Can't hear, you get hearing it. If you can't smell very well, yeah. they go, well, that sucks for you. There's nothing we can do for you. Yeah. Or I don't, I don't know. I I well maybe maybe there's actually an issue with smelling. I don't know if you have like a nose issue. Yeah, but, maybe I don't know. Either. Um, but I think that I think that. Um, 
there's another parallel with singing in that regard. Like the voice is an instrument that's inside your body. Just you know, it's not a guitar or a piano, so mm. you can't really show somebody. You have to kind of demonstrate and and play charades a little bit mm. as a, as a voice teacher to mm. show a student what sensations they should be feeling and and kind of give analogies and that sort of thing. And I think tasting wine is a similar thing because yeah, wow. you can't really explain taste and smell mm. verbally that well so you have to use analogies and and play charades a little bit mm-hmm. in order to convey the information in an effective manner what do, what do you say to people when they uh when you're drinking and tasting wine with people and they say something that's totally wrong like that oh cinnamon and you're like Whoa, way well off. but that's the thing so i don't believe in wrong because i think ultimately it's subjective it's like music so it's you can't like, you can't be wrong then i don't think you can be i i think there are things you can be wrong about in the sense that your perception might be, um, you might be describing something the wrong way. Yeah. Like you perceive, let's say, acidity, and you use a word to describe acidity that doesn't really usually apply to acidity. Yeah. Like you might say it feels flabby, but that's yeah. not what you really <laughs> yeah. associate with acidity yeah. is flab. Yeah. Yeah. But that's just your way of explaining it. You know, that's not really wrong. That's just sort of an atypical way to apply a word to a concept. Yeah, you know, right, it's, right. I. It's tricky wine because, um, th- you know, there are many, it's, it's like what you were saying about doing a podcast, like your, your mission, I guess, is to sort of create an opening to Paris for those who may not know Paris mm. well, or who haven't spent a lot of time here or who are maybe intimidated about the city and want to know more about it, but don't know how to sort of find an entryway into sure. it. I think for me, that's what's interesting in wine. I feel like a translator and I feel yeah. like somebody who is, um, a middleman of sorts in order to get the person from point A to point B, which is get the wine in the glass that they want to drink, you know, and to respect their budget. Um, Because that's the thing about wine is that people get very nervous because they don't know a lot about it. They know that they like certain things. They don't know how to explain it. Mm. And they know it's going to cost them a certain amount of money. Mm. And they're like, how do I avoid the situation where I've spent that money on something that makes me unhappy? Mm. And I perfectly well understand yeah. that. And what they want is a trusted sort of Sherpa yeah. <laughs> to guide them <laughs> towards, Sherpa, Sherpa towards that point B, you know? Well, And you know what else I think that we have in common in your analogy there is... Uh, we can be the bridge, yeah. but also I feel like I can mix it with the Paris experts and I know that you can mix it with the wine experts too. As yeah. in, it's not just about bringing someone that's green into the Paris no. world or the wine world, but of also course. like there's this deep... Respond to people who have high expectations yeah, yeah, yeah. and high levels of yeah. knowledge. That's something that we do a lot in our restaurant. We have a certain reputation for having a quality uh, wine list, which I've worked very hard at. And so we have the privilege of welcoming a lot of wine lovers yeah. we use very you know quality glassware i'm very conscious of temperature control um i'm very conscious of when a wine should be when a wine should be opened or um you know there, there are so many factors in creating a quality wine mm. drinking experience mm. or you know obviously the question of pairing what wine would be you know even better with a certain dish mm. than another mm. not that i believe that there's like one right answer to pairing but um, so we also have the privilege of serving a very, um, you know, knowledgeable wine drinking crowd, people who are collectors or people mm. who, you know, um, really care about having a proper quality wine experience mm. when they have a mm. meal. And uh, so we have really a mix of everybody. And I really enjoy both types of interactions. Yeah, I cool. enjoy serving people who are completely green and have absolutely no idea of how to express what they like but know that they want to have a glass or a bottle of wine with their Mm. meal and and feel like confident in the choice that they've made and i also really enjoy serving somebody who knows you know 10 times more than me Mm. because it's somebody who's been collecting wine for 40 Mm. years and has a salary that i could never even dream of (laughs) you know affording and it's it's you know for me that's also very stimulating and it's a huge learning experience to serve those kind of guests um, one of my old bosses in Montreal used to call them sommelier guests, like the kind of guests right. who know more than most of the sommeliers yeah. that work yeah. in the trade. Can you tell me, and I have a feeling you won't, but <laughs> can you tell me, is there something, like imagine you're talking to a world of people out there, right, and that where you are, who love Paris, love restaurants, love wine maybe. Is there something that they are always doing wrong? That's me slapping my forehead there, guys. Mm. When they talk to someone like you that you wish they wouldn't do? Um... No, because the one thing that comes to mind is that they um, are distrustful. 
Right. Because they're scared of, of putting their money into something that isn't pleasing to them. But I perfectly well understand why. Mm. I mean, they can trust me because I know that I have their best interest at heart. But I also know how many times I've felt that um, a service professional hasn't honored my request properly. And so I can understand why people are distrustful. Mm. Um, it did happen a few days ago. <laughs> and this is a first for me. And I've been in the business for a really long time. Mm. That a, a guest came in and... Um, was looking at the wine list and made me go up and down the stairs four times to get four different bottles so that he could take a photo of the bottle with his wine crowdsourcing application to see if the score was good and that was how he wanted to choose his bottle. What? Oh. So there's an example of where I would say, like, you know, you're in a small restaurant with a, you know, pretty dedicated wine professional who's worked hard to make the selections on the wine list that are there and you're probably better off having a conversation with me about it so that we can guide you in the right direction. But I understand. I get it. The guy may have had some bad experiences. Yeah, you're very patient past. by the sounds of it. Um, I think, I think that everybody's where they are yeah. and you can't judge, uh, you can't judge why somebody has, you know, uh, a certain level of distrust or, or nerves about sure. trusting sure. the person working. So I, maybe the moral is, uh, uh, don't be scared to trust yeah. your sommelier or somebody. You know, you everybody. You know, everybody's different. There are sommeliers where I would I would fly blind, and you know, because everybody knows their own wine list better than you know I might. Like I go to restaurants in Paris, and there are some places where I'm very adamant of making my own choices and and you know doing my own work at the table. And there are some places where I will close my eyes and yeah. give a hundred percent of my confidence yeah. to the person working. Yeah. So, you know, it's like any métier. Uh, there are some people who are better than others at what they do and, and you want to try to seek those out. What about this for a faux pas, right? Uh, you, you go into, you come into your restaurant uh, and you recommend something, they taste it and they say, very nice, but no. For- That's not a faux pas. Well, what if they do it 15 times? It's not really appropriate to do that yeah. because at some point, I mean, it, it's almost never happened to me that someone's right. done that 15 times. It did happen to me recently that I, a guest asked me for a recommendation. I interpreted his recommendation. The result wasn't what he had hoped for, and I immediately switched out the wine at no cost. Yeah. Like There was not even a question for me because I took the risk of recommending something based on what I thought he was looking for, right. and I didn't get it right. Yeah. And Luckily for me, that doesn't happen that often, but it's my responsibility if I'm going to take that on. Yeah. So um, it happened to me once that a guest pretty much rolled through every single wine that we had by the glass and was like, "Mm, no, mm, no. And I think that we just didn't have what they were looking for because we do have um, kind of an emphasis on, I mean, we have a very broad selection of wine, but ultimately we work with uh, non-industrial artisan products, um, and sometimes in some more mass market products, you get a little bit more of like immediate, easy pleasure, like, you know, white wines that taste like green apple mm. and like super crisp and crunchy. And like, you know, we have some of those too, but not quite the same way. And maybe someone who's really used to those kind of flavors might not find their their pleasure, mm. you know? Mm. And that's okay. You, you strike me as a very patient <laughs> kind person i can imagine there are people in your profession who are who are a bit more like um impatient and yeah, not so kind like good yeah, yeah. basically there are. Yeah, who are like, how can they not like that one maybe yeah. uh, maybe uh i think that this is a metier that really attracts um sometimes people who have a certain um a minority i think in the metier but so, sort of a certain pleasure in knowing something about something complex to know yeah. and letting other people that know that they don't know anything yeah. about it i yeah. don't know yeah. i think there are a few jobs like that in the world sure. and for some reason yeah. wine's one of them yeah. i think like anything a little bit obscure that requires a certain level of higher training might might sort of attract that kind of character and sometimes unfortunately it it can happen that some sommeliers kind of revel more in the idea that they know things that you don't mm. rather than like look looking for the answer of what you're yeah you're more of a, you're a matchmaker game. though you want to be a matchmaker yeah yeah, yeah. I get it. i'm like a yenta of one yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i gotta say time is slipping away way quicker than i anticipated uh and i want to do something i haven't done for about 
like two years or something. Okay. Uh, it's the quick fire round <laughs> okay. to end. Let's and what it. It, what it is, this is unscripted. I'm going to give you about five questions. Great. You're not allowed to think too much. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's go. And they're all different subjects. Okay. okay. But we start with uh, what's one wine that you're particularly excited about right now? Uh, grower Champagne. Tell me more. Uh, small growers rather than big houses who actually till their own land, you know, work with their own vines and bottle the wine from grapes that they grow. And is there one particular brand or anything that we keep an eye out for? The Beresh family are sort of pioneers of the region who really make uh, extraordinary, broad, expressive champagnes that I always get a lot of pleasure from. Okay, switching tack. Which is one of your favorite opera songs to sing? Ooh, well, it's been a long time, <laughs> but I guess I really, I really enjoyed singing Verdi. Verdi. Like, as a... As a Composer, I, I can't think of one aria that I particularly like. And for someone other. who's not very good at classical music or opera, would you sing a little bit for it? No. <laughs> it's been a very long time. That's, pro- that's quite old music. I could probably play it here without getting in trouble with copyright. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll get away with it. Um, what about restaurants in Paris? Besides Comis, obviously, is the next port of call for everybody coming to Paris. Um, is there another one? that? Uh, there are a couple of places. There's Moco Nuts for lunch. There are Dear Friends. Mm-hmm. Excellent cooking. Super relaxed place to have lunch and, and just delicious food. Folderol for ice cream and cool wines. And Parcel, which is a bistro in the Marais, which is very hot right now. But honestly, like great cooking and an exceptional wine list. And Excellent service professionals. Um, uh, switching tack again, we're in the 16th hour, this one where you live and work. Is there a site or even a, a place in this district that you recommend to people to check out? Um, I really like to stand on the Pont de Grenelle, yep. which is the bridge that's just um, just towards the center from, from us. And at night, there's an incredible view of the Eiffel Tower mm. on one end and the mini Statue of Liberty on the mm. other, and it's quite... Quite spectacular. Yeah, but you yeah. won't be able to get the two in the one view if you're standing on the bridge because one will be behind you, one will be in front, right? You just have to turn your head. You just got to do the 180 it, it literally requires no effort. Okay. <laughs> last question is, uh, for some reason, it's your last day in Paris. Uh, the authorities are sending you back to Canada. Hope not. Yeah, I wanna, this is quick fire around. Anything can happen. How would you like to spend your last day in the city? Uh, eating. Where? How? Why? Why? The places you said already? Yeah, the places I said already. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just eating and drinking. So just doing a breakfast straight to lunch. Like straight a to six dinner. meal day. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would do. Well, uh, lovely. Let's hope that's not happening anytime soon. The eating, yes, but the, not the being sent to Canada, yeah. uh, no. But um, what a wonderful treat to chat to you, and thanks for sharing your Pleasure. story with us. And I hope everybody listening uh, comes and checks you out. Do you want, if they do, do you want them to be like... Hey, I heard you on the show. Would you rather keep it all professional? We're, no, we're super happy to meet people from all kinds of things and places and things. <laughs> Wonderful. Well said. I couldn't have said it better. Very, very unspecific. <laughs> no, thanks so much for your time. It was lovely to meet you. Pleasure. So that was Atelier uh, talking about her experience. And if you want to find them, I've got their website up right here, comice.paris. Comice is a Michelin-starred fine dining restaurant in the 16th arrondissement of Paris, serving product-driven contemporary French cuisine and a wine list centered on grower producers. There you go, husband and wife team, 30 years of combined professional experience uh, in California, New York, Montreal, and Paris. Do yourself a favor and check it out, and be sure to say hello from me. Let me know what wine you got if you make the visit. 16th hour on this one. Uh, so yeah, that was our chat. I walked back with the last of the marathon runners. I was about the same pace as them at this point. Crossed over the bridge to where I parked my scooter and back home. On the left bank where I'm recording this right now. If you're in Paris on Wednesday, October 20th, we will be having the event that I've sort of been teasing. Uh, it's going to be pretty. There's, there's a lot going on at this event. There's... Uh, a cocktail list. Uh, if you're new around here, by the way, I'm talking about the event for mine and my wife's new book. It's, it's like a launch. It's not one of those stuffy book signings. This is going to be uh, more of a party by the looks of it. We've got cocktails that the location, the venue has made called uh, Hopping Hippos, Roger's Groove, Jazz for Giraffes, The Crocodile Coco Rock. <laughs> Let me tell you what some of these are. Roger's Groove. It's a yellow cocktail with lemon and honey infused gin on the rocks. 
Um, <laughs> I'll publish this whole thing, but uh, if you're in town, get in touch. You should have had the invite already if you're a Patreon supporter. If you're not a Patreon supporter, but you think you should be there, you better send me an email quickly and I'll let you know how to come. Otherwise, we'll be at WH Smith doing a book signing on the 23rd. That's Saturday, and it's uh, 4.30 p.m. I went there this Saturday at 4.30 p.m. just to check out what it was like, and it was so busy. It's kind of nerve-wracking seeing how many people were in there. Uh, but as I walked in, there was an older couple at the window display, which we've taken over, right? So there's this big, like a two-meter crocodile out the front uh, and all our books and a big poster that's got me and Lena's face on it. It's pretty great. It's really surreal, right? And uh, this elderly couple were just like admiring it for long enough that I felt I could walk up and say something. So I go up and I, and I heard they were speaking French. I said, oh, look, I said, that's, uh, it's us that made this book. And the man says, oh, well, I have to say, my name is, he said, je m'appelle Roger, which is obviously French for Roger, and I just think it's fantastic. And I said, well, I can't say the book was named after you, sir, but it's all about a character with the same name as you. And he said, well, I got to get it. And he went in there. Uh, I don't even know. I don't even know if they knew that it was in English, uh, but they went in, they bought it, they we signed it for him, they took a picture, and they said, this can be your practice for your book launch in a week's time. So be like Roger or Roger, this gentleman, and come and meet us. Get your book signed. We'll see you there either on the 20th or the 23rd. Listen, that's enough to keep you going. If you're not in Paris, you can probably feel like you're a lot closer uh, by becoming a Patreon supporter. Patreon.com slash The Earful Tower and uh, opening up a world of bonuses, including the updated uh, Guide to Paris that we've been putting together, which is coming out at the end of October. That'll do for me. Next time you're in Paris, I hope you make it to Comice and say hello uh, to the team there. But wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I hope you have a lovely day, lovely week, lovely month. And I'll be back again on Monday morning with a brand new episode. See you then.